Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome back to the program Jason Miles from uh, This Is Revolution and uh, also uh, Sublation Magazine. Sublation. And don't forget Damage Magazine as well. I also write and it. Damage Magazine. Um, Jason, you should first off know that Kowalski from Nebraska is very proud of you, and oh, I'm you. unclear why. Um, <laughs> but he says it would be helpful and knowing coming from you, from him. Um, all right, let's talk about your piece here. Um, you quoted John Bon Jovi. I did. Hmm. Never thought I would do that in my life. There you go. Not a what, Bon Jovi fan at all. What prompted you to quote John Bon Jovi? Um, I try to write my pieces around music titles. And I was thinking about uh, the Talking Heads. Um, and... Mm. I wanted to call the piece same as it ever was, but I didn't want to necessarily start it with that quote. And I was making a a playlist of 80s glam metal for no good reason. And um, some Bon Jovi stuff kind of showed up there. And I was thinking about that song, One It Dead or Alive, with that line. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start the piece off with the most ridiculous thing ever. and And I did it. Uh, it's all the same only the names will change every day it seems we're wasting away mm -hmm. waste in away waste in yeah. um what 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 has not changed and what do we think it uh what, what do we think has changed um so I, i'll i'll try to be as brief as possible i live in mexico but my children live in the united states in the san francisco area where i'm from and I drive up as often as possible to see them and to see family. And there's a part of California that I get stuck in where my phone dies and I have to listen to conservative radio for a few hours. It's in the central part of the I-5 drive. And it happens every time. And I've been consuming an obscene amount of right-wing content and who are you listening to these days <laughs> what's in your what's in rotation <laughs> there's there's two shows so oh god so i'm so mad at all of you people on the screen so there's there's either it's either a religious a right-wing show uh-huh the national right-wing show and i forget that guy's name mark 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 Lucky. levin Mark Levin. No. Hey, dummy, get off this air. A, a beautiful sounding voice. I can see why you like to and subject then, yourself to it. Oh, my God. It is so bad. And then there's the, like local right wingers yeah. on this. So there's no, there's no uh, diversity of thought um, whatsoever. It's just. No. It's, um, it's uh, format purity is what it's called. Is that what it's called? Format purity? Well, format yep. purity lasts from about uh, Bakersfield. To the edge of Fresno County, when you're hitting almost the outskirts of the of the Bay Area, the kind of hinterlands, as we would call it, of the Bay Area, and then that's when, you know, my phone's finally charged, and <laughs> maybe I can get a friend on the phone or something. But um, there were just some portrayals that these guys had, definitely of crime and of immigration, that I felt were not honest. And they always really? lack uh, context. And th what's the same is that on a bipartisan level, Democrats and Republicans are not the biggest fans of open borders. And I live near the border and I get to see what it looks like. And it definitely doesn't look like the way it's described in right wing media. And I also felt like there, I, I don't know if the left has a proper response um, other than this kind of a generic liberal response to, to, uh, to immigration and crime as well. And I felt like these two things that were victories in 2020 for the Democratic Party were now being used as failures in 2024. If failures by okay, well, let's. I mean, how were they? In what way were they victories for the Democratic Party? Well, and then well, let's talk about like sure. uh, how they're being used as failures. You want to you want to go with like 
immigration, start off with that. Sure. If you think about Trump's uh, very, very strict remain policy, the first thing we started to see in like 20, was it 17, 2018, was those pens that were built and just shoving kids in there, right? We're going we're gonna to systematically separate children from whatever adult they're with. We're going to throw them in these pens. And, and you make the point in the piece that um, the Obama administration did this, but they only did it in instances where there was some uh, significant evidence that the adult the children had come in with was, let's say, was, was committing a crime beyond crossing the border without documentation was uh, bringing in uh, drugs or, uh, or, or wasn't or the parent or wasn't the parent, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, which happens what the, what, think, what yeah. the Trump administration did is they said, anybody who comes across with kids is necessarily violating the law. Therefore we separate them. And so the, the, it was on a whole different level, uh, yeah. uh process. It, and it, it was disgusting. But what you saw in that moment was a, a few things that happened. Number one, people saw children suffering or even heard children suffering, right? With when these news stories came out. And I remember I worked a music festival in El Paso, Texas. Neon Desert is what it's called. And I remember I came there right before that, or right around the time that stuff was happening. And there was like throngs of of volunteers, you know, giving blankets, trying to help with the kids. People really wanted to get involved because it was it's a horrible thing to see children suffering. I mean, you see when you you see these kids getting pulled from their parents, it's a horrible thing to see, right? Much like what you guys are talking about with Israel and, and Gaza, right? There's been a shift in the way people understand that, mainly because you see images of dead children, crying parents. No one wants to see that. I run into conservative people all the time that say things like, this is too much. So the messaging changed, the way people were interpreting it changed, and everybody wanted a better policy, and Trump was the bad guy. Trump has also made himself really easy to hate when it came to immigration. So even though the Trump uh, regime tried to paint this as these caravans of people, you know, at one point in time, you even had Geraldo Rivera talking about, hey, these caravans aren't caravans of terrorists. These are people that are making thousand mile journeys, you know, to get away from something. And you have to think about that for a second. What are you getting away from that you're going right. to you're walk in a jungle? You know, I get scared to walk. And if my water is out here, which happens often, I'm not walking on the other side of my house to flip on the well power because I don't know what crazy scorpion or snake is going to jump out. So you're talking about people that are, you know, crossing jungles and deserts you know, to leave bad situations, they're not just doing that because they're terrorists or they just want to, you know, take your your job, quote unquote. They're trying to, you know, flee bad situations. They are, you know, refugees in every sense of the word. And for a moment, there was a consensus that accepted that. You started to have these things called sanctuary cities, right? Where I'm from in the Bay Area definitely declared themselves a sanctuary city. Chicago did some some really great fights to make their city a true sanctuary city, which means you're not just saying it in in, in rhetorical name, but you're literally saying we're not going to turn over information to federal authorities. Yep. And there's only a few places that really did that. But that narrative has started to change. And there was a strategy that Trump tried to do, but even his people were like, mm, I don't know if it's legal. And that was, you know what, F these, these quote-unquote liberal cities and let's drop off just busloads of, of migrants and see how they like it. That doesn't happen until, was it like 2020? And Abbott, we just did a show with the, the great Cedric Johnson uh, Tuesday where we talked about what's going on in Chicago where they've dropped off 80,000 people. These are human beings. Um, in Chicago, and it's caused a bit of an uproar with the black community because now the way it's being presented is a fight over resources. Yeah. So where immigration was a winning strategy because you could point at the bad guy that's doing the bad thing, even though bad guys are still doing bad things with human beings. 
is it is it the winning strategy this time around? I don't think so. Well, I mean, the there's a couple of things that strike me. One, there was a lot of data that showed that Trump was polarizing enough that people became far more. They saw immigration, race, um, other issues within this sort of like par like a uh, um, uh, sort of uh, paradigm that was either you know if it aligns with Trump then it's it's bad if it if it if it <laughs> is contrary to trump then it's then it's good and we saw people do that right i mean we saw that with you know the muslim ban we saw that with a bunch mm -hmm. of different things um and you're right in terms of the immigration thing and it seems like the democratic party has decided to wave the white flag and move closer to that sort of anti-immigrant um uh, position, right? I mean, that was what that that basically that uh, border pr proposal was by Biden. Um, and uh, the so what are the what do what, what are we talking about here? Is this a, uh, a a a problem with the parties or a problem with the American public? I mean, <laughs> I think the American public dissects information the way it's presented to them first and foremost. And I think we have to understand that. I think, you know, everybody likes to just yell out Chomsky manufacturing consent. It's like, I get what you're trying to say, but, you know, also understand how are you taking in the information that you're consuming and how is it being presented to you? And then how does that information try to ch change public opinion? So again, let's go back to the before 2020. Public opinion is kids in cages bad, but we're not really still talking about immigration, how we like it, because ultimately... Both parties don't really care. They love the fight, right? Both parties love telling you how many people they've deported. I don't remember if I quoted it in the piece because I had I did read quite a few articles on that because I wanted to kind of go back to that time and read what people were saying. But, you know, the Obama administration had no problem bragging about the amount of people that they were deporting. No, he would say he's uh, they would do this. The, the In fact, that was a an explicit strategy. They thought that if they could um, show record deportations, that they could get DACA and DAPA and and do a, a comprehensive uh, immigration bill. Um, and, I, I, you know, it's the same argument that supposedly, I don't know if Biden's making it with sincerity. Like, if I really cozy up to Netanyahu, he'll listen to me when I say, please don't kill as many uh, children. And that, of course, is absurd. I, I almost don't yeah. even think I think I think the uh, uh, the the Obama administration was sincere in their uh, thinking that that was going to work uh, because they were so um, captured by that sort of democratic mind virus. Uh, but at least they had DACA, right? Like at least the uh, Obama administration was just later, later, later in the administration when they realized like, oh, wait a second, we don't have anybody to negotiate. You know, when he was a lame duck, the, he started doing more administrative stuff and more executive actions. But my point is just that Biden is only proposing more militancy at the border compared to uh, to to maybe a, a, there was more of i think a sensitivity to wanting the latino vote from the from the democratic party by with obama than it, there is with biden that's just my read on it but the, you know daca is a complicated situation because i don't think people really understand that there's not a lot of pathways to citizenship within daca and there's tons of limitations and even if you look at what's going on in California, there was going to be a bill where undocumented um, adjuncts, was it students could get jobs and then that changed. So, well, let's be clear. Yeah. DACA is an executive action that is taken. The When I say DACA, mm -hmm. it, was, it was Obama that basically created DACA, which is we're just going to delay. We're going to delay deportation so long that folks, we have downgraded it, and you're safe. And then, uh, and then uh, Trump was going to reverse that. Biden has reinstated it, but the idea was that we were going to get a legislative version, yes. which would have provided anybody who came in those circumstances, not that we're taking discretion on um, applying the law, you know, the uh, deportation, uh, you know, uh, actions against you, but rather you're here and you're a citizen. It was a it was a way kinda. to 
right? It's, it's you're here. You can't vote. You don't have a lot of rights. You can't get a lot well, of no, services. Right now, DACA is that way. But the idea, the legislative fix was to basically say, we're going to make you citizens. And, uh, and you had to qualify for it. So it was only certain people that could qualify for it. It was a very democratic EMC program. I'm not heralding the program. I, it's completely. <laughs> com I mean, my point was just that the the the, the to your point, we backslid Jason, from that. We backslid. Well, what, what I want to say though about the whole same as it ever was is what the Obamas of the world do is I'll signal to you that I'm on your side, but I'm winking to across the aisle that I'm still doing the job of deporting these people. And it's there's such a barrier for citizenship. Yeah. Now you have a captured labor force. Yes, that's exactly it, Jason. We've talked about. I had this is it's kind of uh, prescient that you're on today because yesterday on the show I had John Washington, who wrote the book "The Case for Open Borders" on the program, yeah. and it's it's a really good book. Um, and it's just like reimagining our conversations about the border um we we keep hearing about this crisis on the border crisis on the border but the way that our borders have been constructed over the past 50 60 years is a fairly new phenomenon right i mean and we're seeing this ac across europe as well with georgia maloney defunding the organizations that save migrants from drowning in the sea this is kind of the new frontier in my view of fascism of this border militants and uh as migration con continues to increase due to uh political realities and then also there will be some climate migration climate, as well yeah, this is only going to get worse and to your point biden and, and we've sam and i have talked about this at length biden has done absolutely nothing and he's actually done active harm to re to imagining a, a future and to reorienting the conversation because liberals are now talking about there's a crisis at the border we got to do something about it as opposed to it's like no our existing systems are in crisis because they're deeply deeply immoral and ineffective and and what happens though to the conversation when it's presented to the public at one point is there's a crisis at the border because they're locking up children in cages and they're separating from their parents. Oh my God, I can't wait to go help. And then it turns into, well, there's some pretty bad hombres crossing the border. And it's not just, you know, from the right wing radio, it's like, it's not just uh, Latinos. It's people from Afghanistan and the Chinese. And I'm like, I don't know where these people are coming from. It's so well, there, I mean, there is, in, in fact, there is a piece in the New York times right now. Um, uh, some reporters have gone down there to um, to talk to people who have gone to the Darien Gap, to um, right wing like um, you know people. I don't recognize their names, but they are right. Yeah, this is it. Uh, right wing uh, like um, you Laura know. Loomer. Oh, that's, that's Laura Loomer. Oh, that is Laura Loomer. They're going down and they're shooting a video down there to see. And there are, I mean. The, one of the ways that people uh, um, migrate without documentation into this country, um, if they are coming from, uh, you know, not from Central America or Latin America, is to fly there uh, to get a cheap flight and then to hope to, to cross that way. And we, you know, there are Chinese, there are Afghanistan, there are um, people from all around the world. The, the other half of undocumented in this country have just overstayed a visa, flown in with papers and stayed, uh, you know, longer than they should have. Um, but so what, I mean, what can be done here? I mean, like the, um, and, and, and you also draw a parallel to the, um, the defund movement. Oh yeah. Uh, you're right. Um, and of course, you know, we're seeing crime drop uh, precipitously uh, right now. But uh, and we're seeing that the the rise in crime was supposedly a function of uh, all of the defunding that took place. Uh, mm -hmm. But you wrote, uh, while numerous city governments agreed in principle to decrease police budgets, the defund movement was always a neoliberal project. It was never reimagining of policing, but simply moving a decimal point on a spreadsheet. Fewer traditional armed cops for social workers and more mental health professionals, ultimately a nicer police force to tell the unruly and unhoused to move along. 
maybe provide a service, but these unarmed people would be uh, able to move the blight and poverty without all the, the sirens and in some cases guns. Uh, in, and then you go on to cite like uh, only two of 100 uh, police departments that ABC yeah. studied yeah. had actually decreased their budgets. Yeah. Uh, but everywhere else it went up. Uh, two things. One, well, we, why, in what way was the defund movement only a neoliberal project? Because I'm not you know, sure not I agree with it. We're not talking about reimagining law enforcement, even though that's kind of how people wanted to frame it. We're really talking about taking people that don't work in the law enforcement sector, which are mental health professionals, and now treating them like law enforcement. We're just replacing you, number one, calling you a different name. We're going to move a decimal point over on a spreadsheet, right? That's really that, what it was about. But is that true, though? Because I think the idea was let's narrow the portfolio in the statutory portfolio in which uh, police can respond. So, um, like, there will be rules. Like, um, we don't send, for instance, we don't send uh, police to, um, I don't know, uh, go, uh, you know, uh, check if there's a gas leak. We send or we don't send police if somebody has a heart attack. We don't send police if, um, you know, uh, wh whatever, uh, you know, uh, name some other uh, services where we don't send police. And the idea would be we're going to take some of the circumstances where we do send police and not send police, send other people. But they're who, acting as police, though. Well, but you're talking no. about heart attacks and, and gas leaks. We're talking about, let's say. Spousal abuse. These are common calls that law enforcement gets. Well, um, I think the idea was uh, if there is a question of someone who is um, acting strangely instead of uh, the police getting called in that situation mm -hmm. or even saying, like, do we need uh, guys with guns to do traffic violations? Maybe sure. we don't. Maybe that cuts down on the violence and it cuts down on what the agenda is. The idea would be to to change it from a. Um, uh, a, a, a situation where things could be violent uh, to a, a situation where we would add social services. Again, it ends up being like CPS, right? That's who you call when there's a kid problem. And CPS is pretty much the kid police. It doesn't sound fun, but that's what they are. It's a rough job known people that did it and i know people that left it it's not fun right. right and i worked in services i worked in unhoused services and lived amongst them for a long time uh lived in a van for a minute myself so if there's anyone that understands overreach potential overreach of law enforcement i think i do um I was talking with a friend who also works in services. We work at the same shelter and we went to school together. Good friend. Um, someone got murdered on her site and it wasn't by law enforcement. It was by bounty hunters. She didn't know so there were cops because they had to, to get all buffed out all the yeah. stuff out, and they were all jacked up. The dude had a warrant. You know, he skipped bail, obviously. Um, wasn't the best, but no one deserves to be executed, right? Um, and it's a fucked up situation in in certain environments, right? And as someone that's worked in an environment where you go, I don't want to call the cops. This person has a team of mental health professionals. That's a thing that existed before people were even gave a damn about a hashtag. Right. right. And I remember a Friday, there was a woman who was being unruly and there's rules. You have security on site. Security is not allowed to touch anybody. Seems really pointless. Their job is to observe and, uh, and call the cops if, if need be. And this woman was, a smaller woman, but she had a knife and she was threatening some people and she kicked somebody's dog. And I was trying to de-escalate the situation, which is a wonderful word people love to use. But until you're really in a situation where it's like, I 
to literally remove you from to hold you or push you or something. And you know, we can lose our jobs for that. We can get in a lot of trouble for that. And I'm not making a lot of money, right? Um, and I call the team that was supposed to respond to this woman. And it was four something on a Friday. And the team was already really young. It was really, really young people. And the person on the phone, the dispatcher was like, you said she has a knife? I was like, yeah, I'll call the pops. I was like, but I don't want to call the cops. He's like, right. dude, we're not coming. It's for something on a Friday. We're not coming. Oh, now, I'm not saying all resources act that way. Because in a perfect world, not even in a perfect world, the world we want is the world where there can be a team of professionals that can come help that situation. Right. That don't have guns, right? That being said, it ended up getting de-escalated because another woman that I was friends with in the shelter who was kind of an OG was able to take the woman aside. And it was a horrible situation. The woman was getting beat by the dude who got her into the shelter in the first place. So the only place that she had to stay was with a dude that was already beating right. her ass and right. pimping her out. You know, it's it's a uh, everything about it is ugly. I, but it's I, the re, it's reality, and we have to figure out how we want to deal with it. And but I but how think, how like but but as a system, like yeah. you know, um, what is the way that you deal with that? I mean, as a systematic response, like yeah. fortunately you're there. Yeah, you're calling and saying like I I, I don't want to call the cops, yeah. but. Some other uh, guy who makes that same call will be like, "Yeah, actually, I called the cops first. I didn't even call them." Like, but but as a system, mm -hmm. like what, like what? And, and that you know what, Sam? That happened more often than not. Actually, where people called the cops the moment something happened. I remember there was one moment where there was a couple, and the the boyfriend was. He was a very large dude, but he was really quiet. But apparently when he would get into their room, he was super violent and we didn't know about it. And you only have five or six counselors in this. This building was a was an old hotel, so it had like 350 people in it. So imagine you got like six counselors and a small handful of us to handle 350 people with 350 problems. And... Uh, this this young man, who was actually, the stat part was he was kind of cool, he would just go in the room and get tweaked out and just beat holes in the wall around her. He'd hit her, and she finally gathered the courage. Because we would never see her. She finally gathered the courage, and she was shaking. And she comes down, excuse me if I get a little emotional, she comes down and she goes, I need you to remove, you know, my my guy. And we're like, okay, what's going on? And she's like, hit me, and I want you to call the police. Okay. We call the police. Police always come in, ask you what the situation is. They very calmly took dude out. Now, I can sit here for the next hour and tell you guys stories about dudes that came in, beat the hell out of somebody, back and forth and back and forth you had to remove people you didn't want to remove people um i'm not saying this to say get rid of these things i'm not saying this to say that we need more police and if that's what you gather from it that's a really oversimplification and you're not really listening these are these are the uncomfortable things that get under your fingernails these are the uncomfortable conversations that we have to have truly about these <clears throat> these things because hashtags are simple no, I get that. I, I mean, I get that. I'm still not like a hundred percent sure. And, I have a sense of like, what is, and you, you know, what do you, I would love to see, you know, whenever we would get people that would come in there that were like, quote unquote lefty, because when you work in services, you work with all kinds of people, you know? Right. And, and the la most people are apolitical at best. And most people that, would identify as something that we would know. I'm a, this is, they would leave in like a couple weeks. Because you're the enemy to the people you're trying to help. 
Sure. So what's your vision for, for how community investment could look better? I think first of all, we have to understand that it's going to be ugly. Eggs have to be broken to make the omelet. It's going to get ugly. And you can't throw the baby out. It means you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like you're going to have, you're going to have places like, situation where my friend works where it's a a housing unit that how i forget how many people it houses but it's probably going to be violent there for a while before it gets better and that's the hard part to try to get to people like this might be ugly this isn't a simple solution you don't give somebody a house and they go thanks and then they just stop doing the shit that got them homeless in the first place Right. Okay. I mean, not everybody, not everybody wants to accept services. Number one. Right. Do you want to be a society that forces services on people? There's a law that just passed in California, right? Proposition one, much like what you guys have in New York, where you're kind of forcing people that are mentally ill into treatment. Is that what we want to do? No, no, my, my, I don't think people, when they talk about guaranteed housing, think it's going to solve all the, the horror that you're describing. I mean, I think your I point is... Y- I, who, I believe who? people really believe that. Who? Most people on the street that vote really believe that. That's why people vote for these measures. What measures? The hard part is to say that it's going to get ugly for a little bit before it gets better because this is generational trauma people are dealing with. And... How many people do you have working in these environments that can help people adequately? Well, isn't that the, that, that, that's, I thought what the point is, you cut the police budget. And so instead of there being six people working in that facility, there's 12 or there's 18 or these facilities aren't run by the state, Sam. These are nonprofits. Well, but these nonprofits are all getting, I mean, it's, it's more often than not, uh, nonprofits get, um, uh, you know, NGOs will get their funding from uh, municipalities uh, a lot of times to provide these services, mm-hmm. um, you know, and these are the grants. And this is where, I mean, that's, that's where theoretically some of that funding will go. I mean, we have the budget of the police department in this, uh, in this city is massive. Um, it is, it's really, I mean, that's basically what the city does. It runs a police department, mm-hmm. uh, you know, on a dollar basis. And the, and the question is, is, are there areas where you can begin to address some of these problems? And there's no panacea, right? I mean, like the, you know, people have problems and, um, uh, but can you both sort of like intervene before uh, these problems um, uh, get exacerbated and also deal with those um, those people once they have dealt with these traumas and are trying to you know sort of get past or, or, or mo- moving past I mean the the idea is to intervene in a way that is more targeted to uh, the problems that exist in these communities of people, um, and, and, you, and you have to have people that as opposed want- to the the police department, which is a uh, wear a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. Some instances it's a I'm screw, a- in some instances it's a w- whatever. I mean, isn't that the idea? Again, I, I guess the question is that like, we're talking about facilities and building these facilities, and are you going to take police budgets and then build facilities? Are you talking about you're taking police budgets and we're going to have less mobile tanks, right? And, and less Kevlar vests and we're going to hire more mental health professionals, quote unquote, but what are those mental health professionals responding to? Right. We're not talking about people that are, I am your counselor. I'm the person you're going to talk to for the next five years. We're talking about, I'm the guy that's going to come here to tell you to move along in a nice way. I'm going to respond to the subway. We had it with our with our uh, our subway system here in the Bay Area. We're going to have uh, mental health professionals instead of law enforcement. But it's like, well, they're just they're doing the same thing in a nicer way. Connecting me with services is handing me a card. You know what I mean? I mean, there. I think there are 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 processes that work better than others, and I think that you. Uh, but I think that like. Um, and I, and I think that 
it doesn't necessarily in any way mean that we that this is going to solve the problem without like we need to build more housing we need to build more facilities or what i mean you need to have caps on rent first and foremost you know sure. we both no, no, live yeah. in sure. ridiculously expensive cities and when i said that everybody's head nodded that changes the whole conversation about housing when you say something like that of course first and foremost right and you know when you work in these facilities every day you know i i loved the people i love the present tense the people that not only that i work with my coworkers, but the the people that i i helped on a daily basis and you know part of me feels like bad sometimes because i did leave it <clears throat> to do this I'm sorry i'm getting a little emotional but you know um You're up against a lot of walls, um, a lot of burnout. In that, yeah. um, I wasn't burnout. I can deal with. I can deal with that. I'd much rather. This is gonna sound stupid. I'd much rather deal with the chaos of the shelter than the internet. I'd much rather deal with those people telling me to f off all day than you know, <laughs> ass maggot forty five telling me that I'm a stupid lib that doesn't know anything. Right. Um but what we were able to accomplish in a short time in that in that facility which is no longer you know we we had uh education facilities for the kids that were there there was only a handful of kids but we used people that used to teach that were in the facility as well instead of bringing in outside people um we were able to do like physical therapy for them we were having uh, counseling sessions for women dealing with violence counseling sessions for men dealing with violence it's a long-term process right and not everybody's on board because every four years you get turnover and that's kind of my big point is when i say this it wasn't like 400 people showed up to these sessions you know it's five and it might not even be the five that you really want that are the most violent but you start with that and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and then the fourth year happens well we got to kill funding for this because this many rapes happened on site this many assaults happened on site yada 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 happened this isn't working we're just move on to the next thing and it's like well let's we learned from that thing that happened that caused those accidents we're trying to change some some uh security features here and there you know, let's try, let's try, let, let, let's, let's not throw this away yet. And that's also hard to get across in messaging. I mean, this is the, the, the problem that you're discussing, I think is also sort of a problem that we have with, um, with education. It's a problem we have with, uh, healthcare, mm -hmm. um, in, in many respects, because any, um, any type of social service that, is um the actions require an adjustment to who it is that they're serving mm -hmm. is an extremely different thing to met a difficult thing to message you that's why it's so e why cops are such an easy answer mm -hmm. for people because they do the same thing every time mm -hmm. they they use force and they deal with the problem that is like what we and it is a much harder thing to have these different services um that see the 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 client if you will where they are react to that it's gonna be uh it's more difficult it's the way that the dynamic with education it's also why you know the educational reform movement was so effective because it just said like oh we have a number that tells us how successful this teacher is we don't have to get into like the nuance of teaching, which is exactly what teaching is. Teaching is figuring out who the student is and what they need, as opposed to being able to put in a, you know, sort of like a predetermined uh, formula and have uh, some type of output and measure it uh, there. Um, but I think at the end of the day, that's only, you're only going to be able to do that by providing funding and, you know, on a municipal and state level, they don't have the ability to print money. 
So well, it's yeah. really just and, like, and, and you got to take funding gonna... from this column and put it into that column and then hope that that column, you know, is effective and you have good personnel who are going to deploy that stuff in a way that's going to make sense. I mean, look, I'm not going to say the, the the hashtag movements. Sometimes I think the problem with hashtag movements is not sometimes is everything is all encompassing and the good and the bad. So it's easy to feel like we can throw the baby away with the bathwater. And I think the hashtag, everything about hashtags is annoying as shit to me because it doesn't really get into the nuance of some of the good things that those things do. Right. So there was a moment as well before 2020 that the way we view law enforcement overreach starts to get viewed on the news a lot. I mean, this country exploded with George Floyd, right? And only four years later, the same people that have BLM signs and, and uh, I stand with George Floyd signs were like, well, we need more cops because there's a, there's a RV parked across the street from my house. And I don't like it. And the cops aren't mm -hmm. coming. And I, I don't say this as conjecture as something I've, I just heard in passing. I say this from interviewing city council representatives from Los Angeles County that were, were saying this to me, you know, in our, in our conversations. So it, it did some things, right? Like, look, I'm a huge proponent of not having cops in schools. I went to two different schools. I went to school in Richmond, California, where I'm from. And I got to go to school in Albany, California, where my dad worked. Very different environments. Kids did drugs in both of them. Kids fought in both of them. Kids cut class in both of them. But in one of them, there was a cop outside waiting for you if you effed up. In the other one, there was not. Those are life-changing situations. I got in a fight in high school. The vice principal called my father who worked there and the kid that I was in a fight with, dad, who coincidentally worked for Oakland PD. <laughs> and our fathers met in the principal office. Fought it out. <laughs> they told us to fight it out. Our father said, um, the principal's given us permission to take you to the boys club. Oh, really? Yeah. If you guys want to fight, fight. You, you have permission to leave campus and fight. If not, I think I think one of our dads said, stop being punks and shake hands like men. And we did. And we've you know, been friends ever since. But um, the high school in the city I'm from, you don't get that option. Right. Right. That's massive. I can have a, I can have a felony. I can have a strike changes my life 100 percent, 100 percent. getting cops out of schools huge yeah huge right that's part of that movement right we all are now aware even though people were fighting for years before that to do that it elevated that to a certain point it gets those people out of there yep i, th I, th I think we can all be on board for, for for something like that so there's there is good things that that do happen from it but also in the city that, that I was born in, Oakland, California, when they did get the police to like reallocate some funds, part of the group that did it, like half of them wrote a letter saying, please don't fire any cops because we live in the hood and we're scared for our children as they go to school because these cats are out here shooting like crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's I I mean I think the point is ultimately is that you know one thing is not going to uh be sufficient. Um and uh that, that there's I mean, you know, again, this is something I think we've said many times is that you know we have a wide range of uh, of of changes to society to address these problems. But yeah, it's I not mean, just clean needles, for instance. But yeah. uh, <laughs> no, it's not we've just got clean a, but I do have to say, like, j there's one thing, Jason, though, like I, I have to say, like I am um, a bit on guard against a, a too um, 
overcorrection on this because I see people talking about, say, retail theft and talk about mm. that's not a resources Oof. problem. Oof. And I got to say, like, from what I've heard using on New Republic stuff, like, actually, that does seem like it is people who are driven through a type of desperation and are being exploited as such. And actually, like, if we actually dealt with uh, not breaking people on things like addiction or uh, housing, actually, these sorts of crimes would be addressed in a pretty significant way. So, like, I agree with the general take about mm -hmm. crime or, like, these sorts of... We can't treat poverty and hope to get rid of all crime, but I do, frankly, worry about an overcorrection on this. You mean like too much police force? Like somebody saying um, the people that are boosting stuff from retail places that has nothing to do with uh, underinvestment in them or as like any sort of oh, thing other than oh, oh, like oh, yeah. needing force. And like I think that is an over application of what you're saying because I fully agree that there is a type of liberal who looks at like safe injection sites and be like, okay, we're done with that problem. And I think that is a, that is a real risk in our current political constellation. But I also see a big problem where people say like, well, like they, they attack the left saying you're naive, not actually um, by explaining away, say retail, um, these retail boosters by saying it's something to do with poverty. And you actually look at them and they're all supporting habits. So like I mean th that's just what I'm mm. concerned. That's a concern. I mean, I do have. some people just steal because they want to steal? Like that's that's it can't be a reality. I don't I think mean, everybody that's a like, that's a booster is doing it to fucking fund a habit. I think some people just want fucking. I bullshit. mean, I cited I cited a New Republic guy who talked to a bunch of people arrested in Brooklyn boosting, and mm -hmm. they said they don't know anybody who was doing it for not for out that reason. And then the actual like Brooklyn DA's office said eighty ninety percent of these people. And it to me, it's like even 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 if it was one third, I would think that actually addiction is probably a better thing to address than cops. But it's over. 50% by Brooklyn numbers. And that's where I'm at. Well, you know, they overcorrected to your point in San Francisco and they changed what is going to be grand theft because it was higher because of the conditions in the prisons. Um, the conditions in prisons were so bad in the two thousands that, you know, people were dying in holding cells. People were dying, waiting to get, get healthcare. So it was so yeah. bad. So they started letting people out. So that's that, that happens in like 2010. And for a long time, that's the way it's been. Uh, again, it goes back to the way we, we see this stuff. It's not like I've never seen people rob stuff or boost stuff from the store. It ought to, look, I, I feel comfortable saying this now. You know, I owned a lot of stolen stuff. I had a friend that worked at uh, uh, Macy's in San Jose, California. And I, I was like, dude, how do you have so many polo shirts? This is like 1998. He's like, oh, we just steal them. Like, come down to the job. We'll steal a bunch with you, too. So, I was part of a culture of that at one point in my life. I guess I, you know, we never did the whole run in and rob it. I think it just maybe plays well for the cameras, but um. But I it, listen. I go ahead. I mean, I guess I mean, and we got to wrap this up in a second. But I think that like the, I, I don't think there is a society where there isn't some of that, and in particularly a society that you know is so um uh. Uh, built around the status associated with those polo shirts uh, back in those days. I mean, that was it. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I remember that. It was like, you know, if you have a Ralph Lauren shirt, like that oh, was, dude. whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, dude. what's, who's this guy? And, uh, and yeah, but, every, Sam, every color, Sam. No, nah, yeah, I know. I mean, like I, 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 I lived through that era. Like, you know, like, oh, wow, that guy's got that Ralph Lauren cologne in the green bottle or whatever it was. Broke his like, hell. But... Um, the, I, I don't think, but I think, like, there's no society that exists without that on some level. And I guess, and certainly no society that is, um, values money and material goods in the way that our society does, that you're not going to get some of that. But again, it's like, we're talking about um, how do you deal with 30% of it or 50% of it or 60% of it that also is a function of, of human suffering in some fashion or another because society is not providing the uh, basic elements that one would think we have progressed to in the evolution of society, right? Like um we should now be able to uh, to have developed those things and so i don't know i don't know and if it's but capital overcorrects by saying we're going to give more power to uh, uh bodyguards to these these uh guards that guard this stuff 
you know, uh, that happened in San Francisco where uh, a young uh, trans man was shot by a bodyguard. They, they got into a scuffle or, or a, 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 what do you call them? Mall cop, whatever you call them. They have right. guns in San Francisco. But, um, you know, shot him, killed him. They got into a little scuffle. The person didn't have a weapon. They threatened him or whatever. And the guy didn't serve any time. It's a more complicated story than just, you know, that. But still, um, you start to give more autonomy to non-law enforcement even to have these extrajudicial powers to to put people down for, for stealing. And to Matt's point, then it becomes a mix of the people that are just robbing the rob or whatever. And, and people actually, the, the trans person that was stealing was actually stealing food because they were battling with uh, uh, being unhoused. Right. And they were trying to steal food. And this person decided that this was the fight that we're going to get into over somebody stealing food. At, yeah. a, at a wall or a CVS in downtown San Francisco, and a, a life got lost over, you know, some candy bars. Well, fascinating that, piece. Yeah, sorry. Uh, fascinating piece, Jason. We're going to put a link to uh, um, same as it ever was in Sublation Magazine: the illusion of politi American political discourse in the media. Thanks so much for your time today, man. Great to see you. Hey, th Sam, uh, Emma, Matt, Bradley, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for for having uh, an uncomfortable conversation with me. It was a good time. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Right. Thanks, Jason.